Hello there and welcome to a new video for RimWorld. In this one I got 10 advanced tips and tricks for advanced problems. So we're going to talk about mid and late game issues, solutions for that, strategies to get safely there, you name it. With that being said, let's get started right away with number one. I want to talk about melee choke points here. Later in the game you will get attacked by large numbers of melee attackers, be that tribal attackers, manhunters, infestations, there's always something trying to overwhelm you. And defense lines like these get simply overrun by enemies at that point. So what you need are situations like these, where you can just set up three people here and the enemy is forced to come one by one. Combine that with a couple of shooters right behind there or high range weapons behind there and you have a situation where the enemy's amount of power in, in numbers is limited. You can use that also inside your base and you should use that if your base is located below a mountain because of infestations. Here I use two tile-wide corridors. This is pretty cool because this allows you to have larger squadrons of shooters. If you'd had only a one tile-wide corridor it would be harder to string up enough shooters. Also two fighters step uh, back um, standing right next to each other are packing a lot more punch because you know give them nice melee weapons and they actually do deal quite a lot of damage if you want to use grenades which i strongly recommend you to you have to th you have to put the grenade people directly behind your melee people to avoid friendly fire Okay, so let's get on over to number two. Let's talk siege breakers. So you will get sieged at some point. That means the enemy will set up a small base at the end of your map here. This was once a siege. And they'll build up mortars, they'll set up shop there, and they'll then they'll lob mortar shells on your base. Pretty nasty. So the key to beating these is to know that if they receive enough pressure, they uninstall all their gear and transform into a regular attacking raid. So to achieve that there are several ways and means. Very easy ways and means are things like rocket launchers, orbital lasers and these things. Just inflict enough damage and they'll attack you. I strongly recommend rocket launchers and stuff like that for this, but there are also a little bit more subtle methods like for example a psychic insanity lance. This one sends a person berserk and I've made the experience berserking one enemy has had quite often the result that they attacked me right after. Pretty nifty stuff. If all these methods fail, there is always the ways and means to have your own mortars. I strongly recommend you to have some if you don't have any siege breaker items that I have mentioned here because the other way to force them to attack you is to shoot enough mortar shells on top of them and eventually you either hit enough enemies, explode their ammo, my experience was they'll always come attacking you after a while. Okay, number three is about trading. You know, if you don't opt out of trading by situating your colony somewhere where there's no trade possible, trade is a massive power tool. Every one of your highly civilized uh, partners in the vicinity can provide massively nice gear. But even if you don't want to go for all those super nice gear items, it pays off to be friends and trading with the other factions a lot. So one thing worth mentioning about that, in case you're worrying about, hey I need to send off so many people icon, who defends my base? So if you have a colony of 10 people and you send 6 people off for trading purposes, the attacks will be scaled down to the four remaining people. The game always sends enemies according to what's currently on your map and not what's uh, inside your entire faction. So don't worry about that part. All in all, I strongly recommend you to use trade. If you don't want to, well, you're you're giving your you're giving up a very powerful tool there. I often voluntarily opt out of certain trades because it's that powerful. It's easy to grind up trade materials that you can produce in large numbers and sell away. Be it chem fuel or drug production, there are so many ways of simply producing massive amounts of money 
that you can turn directly into useful stuff. Trade is power, use it. Number four is about wealth management. Goes quite nicely with the trade, isn't it? Because there is a downside to all these things. This yellow bar here, this is your colony's wealth. In case you didn't know it, this bar also directly scales the attacks of the storyteller on your base. In short terms, the richer you are, the harder you get hit. So therefore, many people are opting out allocating too much wealth into your colony. It's up to you. I wouldn't say that you need to force yourself, like you see here, I have gone for insanely valuable carpets and stuff like that, but it's worth mentioning in so far that you don't need to dislodge every single ship chunk. Oh, where are they? Oh, well, I don't have any on these map anymore. Um, in short, you know, everything that you don't have deconstructed or, or put into your possession doesn't increase the value of your colony. So you don't need to mine out that gold ore before you need it. You don't need to mine out those uh, compact machineries before you need them. These things, they, they don't matter that much early on, but the later in the game you are, the more scaling there is. Also, it's a nice way to to taunt the storyteller into hitting you as hard as possible by just racking up gold statue of a gold statue. It's up to you, but I think it's very much worth knowing that the wealth is directly influencing your colony's threat. So if you are feeling like it's too hard, you can always pack up a caravan and gift away your wealth to your neighbors. That's the easy way to get rid of wealth. Because if it ain't on your map anymore, it's not influencing your colony anymore. Okay, enough about that topic. Let's get on over to number five, armor. Armor is massively important as soon as you get into the later stages of the game. Early on, you don't really need that much of armor. Later on, it's really, really super important when the enemy is getting better and better equipment. I highly recommend you to look into this tree here. Safcrafted marine armor is costly but extremely powerful. A budget version, the recon armor is also highly recommendable. It's way lower on resource cost and it has really really well uh, really really good protection values and if you want to have the budget budget version flak armor is still a lot better than nothing and only comprised out of cloth and steel and therefore pretty easy to produce. I don't know if it is components involved too. It's been a while since I crafted my last flak gear. But in a nutshell, investment investing into armor later on is vital. Don't skip it. You'll really notice it. At least invest into armor in your valuable gear, into in, in your valuable guys, people that you want to stay and keep safe. Alrighty, another good thing to know about armor, these shield packs here. They are really, really cool. Shield cores can be transformed into low shields. You need the shield tech for that. And then you can just uh, pack up low shield packs and they are massive because they allow you to shoot out of a bubble and the enemy is not capable to shoot inside your bubble until the bubble breaks. And the best part about it, these things aren't truly consumables. You can recharge them after use. Of course, during the fight, they can be only used one. But if you have like two or three of these babies, you can withstand massive gunfire. That's really important. You have different ways of armoring yourself up. You can also go for shield belts for melees, also powerful. But whatever you do, armor your people later on. It's vital. Number six is a way to seal off your base. It's really, really important that you have a way to permanently seal off the base. Here, for example, I usually leave this door here open via hold open, so enemies that come on in want to take that tour here, zoom, 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 and they want to go into the base via this door. But if I have it like this, the enemy won't find any way inside. Why is that important, you might ask yourself. Sometimes you just don't want to fight those 40 polar bears on outside of your base. You just don't want to, because you don't need to. And the best part about it is, sometimes it's even paying off to just let 
things simmer outside and hide inside. This base, for example, has everything inside it needs. We produce our own food, we produce our own power, we produce everything we need inside these walls. So, who needs the outside world? Nobody. Exactly. In that way, you can utilize huge manhunter packs. Um, what are they called again? Mechanoid clusters that have no direct uh, threat factors. All these things can be utilized to break the next raid coming onto your map or something like that. Basically, in a nutshell, if you don't want to fight the enemy outside, if it ain't raiders that just break your walls or, or mechanoids that would do that or infestations, just close the door and, and let them simmer outside and use enemies to, to beat, them, so beat each other up. But that only works if you have a door that you can open and close, and I'd strongly recommend you to consider that strategy. Sometimes it's really amazing to use those huge manhunter packs against each other. Now then, let's talk about number seven. I want to talk about guns. So I personally am convinced that the easiest way of beating enemies without breaking too much of a uh, brain cell is like follows. Salt rifles as your standard weapon, a few chain shotguns for incoming melee enemies, sniper rifles for slow moving targets like centipedes and stuff like that, and you're all set. You could of course use all the other guns that are involved in the game. As many people love these, and, uh, you know, if you're a gun nut you will probably install several different uh, mods like that, but if you don't want to pay attention to guns, that's all you need. You can opt over to charge rifles if you want to break mechanoids later easier because these have a high armor penetration. But if you're a lazy bum like I am, assault rifles for high range, chain shotguns for melees, sniper rifles for slow moving targets, and you're all set. All the guns you need. So let's go on over to number eight. A simple one, but very, very effective. Limit your kitchen access, like here. So here, this door is the only one leading into the kitchen, and I only have one person, or these two persons, on the cooking schedule. This means only cooks will enter and leave the kitchen. Why is that important? Because if you arrange your kitchen unfavorably, people will walk over walk through this room over and over again and we will spread dirt. This setup makes sure that only the cooks will carry their dirt into the kitchen and nobody else. You can of course arrange it differently, but in a nutshell, limit the limiting the traveling people through your kitchen does a lot does a lot for your um, colony to avoid food poisonings. And believe me when I say food poisonings have sometimes lost me really really easy fights or yeah you know food poisonings they just suck all right number nine is set yourself up a medical room what do i mean with medical room one room in your colony should have at least carpeting a lamp right next to that a good quality bed as good as possible and if you can if you have the necessary materials, you can go for sterile tiles. These increase the um, cleanliness even more. And if you want to be super, super, super involved, you can also set up a medical monitor and a medical bed. These can all be here. Hospital bed and vitals monitor. Why is this so important? There should be one room that's perfectly optimized to be as good as possible for medicine because you will want to have a as high as possible success chance for those prosthetics. When you have ever botched up a installation of an architect body part, you know the pain. And this is the best you can do to make sure that these things don't go, don't blow up in your face. So for example, here my lab could be hosting a medical bed with a vitals monitor, no big deal. But also make sure that there's enough light there. Darkness is also really, really detrimental for the success of a doctor. And the quality of the bed does matter a lot. A legendary quality bed legendary quality medical bed would be a dream but a legendary quality regular bed 
can be amazing. Excellent or masterwork quality suffices as well. Enough about that, medical rooms, they rock. So, number 10, the last one on the list for today is regarding two secret weapons against mechanoids. So, number one is the smoke launcher. This is really, really cool because it is the secret weapon against every mechanoid cluster. The trick here is that while this smoke screen here is lasting, turrets can't target you. So you can use the smoke screens to blast down the remaining turrets of the mechanoid clusters because without smoke screens, these things are vicious, really, really, really vicious. The other thing that is extremely powerful against mechanoids are EMP uh, grenades, so, or EMP launchers. EMP is just stunning those guys, and you'll find that in the microelectronics tab here, grenades or launchers. Personally prefer grenades because they lobbed faster and somehow the accuracy seems to be higher. Don't ask, it's my personal impression. But in a nutshell, EMP grenades stun, and the smoke launchers, they give you the opportunity to crack open those mech clusters quite easily without worrying too much about the turrets. So that's all I got to say. I hope you found that helpful. Feel free to leave me your comments. Feel free to leave a thumbs up. And of course, consider subscribing. I'd be delighted if you did so. Have a wonderful day and see you soon.